It's a great pleasure this afternoon, and no, this morning, uh, to welcome along uh, Maurice Bouchard to uh, the Rosen Institute. I guess most of the times I've bumped into Maurice has been uh, in the margins of the Pig Breeders Round Table series, which he was heavily involved with over the years. Um, but you don't want to know about um, that. What you'd like to know is um, who our speaker is. Uh, given that Morris and I are not as young as we used to be, um, this little brief cameo goes back quite a long way because he um, read animal production at Reading uh, quite a long time ago. A PhD in sheep breeding in Newcastle, pushed up in Minnesota, uh, then came back to Newcastle where um, he lectured in poultry, sheep and, and pig improvement. Uh, but then he spent, I guess, the bulk of his working life um, working in industry um, as a consultant or technical director for the Pig Improvement Company, the uh, biggest pig breeding company in the world, and now integrated into Genus um, PLC, with whom the Institute has a strategic research partnership. Um, and since retiring, um, he's been involved in dairy cattle improvement, uh, particularly with the, the Guernsey breed. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Morris here in what uh, we plan to be the first of an, a series of um, lectures uh, which we'll record and put out on the web so that the audience reaches beyond those in the room. And I'm grateful to, to John Hickey for initiating uh, this series and uh, it has the, the blessing of the, the senior management of the Institute and we think it's a, a very welcome um, initiative. And we're delighted to have Morris to give us the, the first lecture in this series. So, Morris Bichon, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, very nice to be up in Edinburgh again. Um, I imagine the audience is a pretty mixed group. Some of you I know are heavily involved in animal breeding as such, actually going on to farms and talking to farmers and breeders and so on. Some of you, I guess, don't do this very much and haven't come up an animal breeding agricultural stream. So inevitably I felt I should not satisfy either audience. I'm going to talk initially about some animal breeding uh, basics and then get on to see why we have made rather little progress over a long time. I put that up because that's, for many of us, where it all started. J. Lush published the first edition of that book back in 1937. And at that stage, he and his students had pretty well analysed the situation and laid out what needed to be done to improve livestock. 80 years ago. Some of us had to wait until Douglas Faulkner published his book, and I remember eagerly as a postgrad going to buy my buy the copy as it first came out of the book in Newcastle, uh, first came out of the bookshop. Um, and the beauty of that book was that if you'd had just an elementary uh, tutoring in statistics, you could at least see how all the basic equations of animal breeding had been derived. Well, that was 1960, 55 years ago. And right from the beginning, <coughs> they laid out quite clearly what needed to be done in order to improve a breed or a line of livestock. Three different methods, either you replace the breed you've got and bring in a better one, you combine two or more breeds either on a repeated basis or to produce a composite or a synthetic, uh, but the most important one of all of course is within breed selection, actually changing allelic frequencies in the line that you're working with. Well, so what's happened? We could have fun and look at all of our livestock. I've only put up this one slide on it. Clearly, there used to be, and luckily there still are, an enormous number of different breeds of poultry. But 
commercially these days we use very few of them. A few lines have gone into the meat side, a few have gone into egg layers, the others haven't been lost, they're in the entertainment industry. All sorts of showing goes on, people keep these animals, that's fine. And to an extent it's happened in the other species. So breed replacement has gone on. In this country, and of course I'll be focusing mainly on this country, um, we've had quite a lot of continental breeds come in, particularly in sheep and cattle, um, a few in the way of pigs, and there's been a lot of replacement as people have identified the qualities of other breeds. Crossbreeding, too, has been pretty well exploited, and this has been done by farmers. Uh, it didn't necessarily need a lot of geneticists to tell them they looked and tried, and we have crossbreeding pretty well exploited, in, certainly in poultry pigs and beef cattle. Uh, note, however, that our dairy cows are still mainly purebred Holstein Friesian in this country, and that has disadvantages in terms of reproduction, longevity, and so on. And our hill ewes are still purebred, in spite of the fact that scientists here in Edinburgh demonstrated 50 years ago, I'm sure, that uh, crossbred ewes could do better, even a cross between the black faced and the swale ale would do better than either of them on the hills. So we haven't uh, done everything in that area. Okay, but the really key business, of course, is uh, the engine which drives improvement continuously uh, is within breed selection. So our academics were looking at this early, back in the 20s even, in America certainly in the 30s, and over here there was a lot of activity in that uh, two decades between 1940 and 1960. It occurred to me that if Bill Hill had come to Edinburgh a little later, he might have found himself working on an analysis of one of the sheep breeds or cattle breeds. That had already been done by the time he arrived and he was able to go on to different things. People wanted to know what is a breed. What our livestock are in breeds, many of them in uh, herd books, flock books. Uh, they're registered there so that they can have a pedigree. I want to look at one example near to my heart. And those of you who are not very familiar with sheep farming in Britain ought to know that now, but even more back in 1960, um, our, we had two big blocks of sheep. Up in the hills, we had the hill breeds where they were primarily bred to stay alive, up in rather difficult conditions. On the other hand, on the lowlands, we have another big block of, of ewes, and they of course could be anything, any sorts of breeds, and there were all sorts of pure lowland breeds, for those of you who don't know the Border Leicester, it's a rather magnificent beast uh, with a lot of drama around the sales, the Kelso Ram sales, all this hoo-ha, which of course still goes on today. Um, they used to colour them in the wool to uh, make them look even more special. Um, and I want to use the Border Leicester as an example of the structure of our pedigree breeds. I looked at the flock books from 1955 and there were 650 odd flocks. The only function of the borderless breed, it has no other job in life, but to provide rams to cross onto culled hill ewes at the bottom there and produce those half-breds or mules or whatever that go down on the lowlands and produce there. They convert that hill uh, gene pool into something more useful when it's working on the lowlands. Now, the structure that emerged there was typical of all of our pedigree livestock. Most of the flocks didn't register any ram lambs. They produced ram lambs for sale, but they were not pedigreed. They just sold them for crossing. 
only a couple of hundred flocks were registering ram lambs. They all registered ewe lambs, so that you could get a pedigree for them all. But if you look carefully at those couple of hundred flocks, I identified 26 flocks, which we can call elite or influential. And how do we define that? I defined it by the fact that they bought 75% of their ram lambs. They're too small, these flocks, they can't remain closed, so they have to buy from somebody, and they bought them from each other, a sort of club. They only bought a quarter of their ram lambs from those large number of flocks below. So we have this stratification of breeds, and this is something that was found to be typical of all of our pure breeds. And Alan Robertson looked at this uh, and got a, a numerical description of breed structure back in 1953. And because a lot of his colleagues up here in Edinburgh had been looking at sheep and goats and cattle, and made the generalization that whenever we look at a pedigree breed, fewer than 30 flocks or herds are really having any permanent effect. So those are the key uh, flocks structures. In 1966, we had a very influential, well, important book, whether it was influential. I wonder how many people in this room have read Lerner and Donald's book. It's almost the only book on animal breeding, its economic basis, its sociological basis. Lots of books on how to make progress faster, on mathematical theory and everything else. But a book about animal breeding, Hugh Donald was the director of the Animal Breeding Research Organization here in Edinburgh. And I've taken this diagram pretty much from one of their figures which they put forward as the uh, basic method of improving a livestock breed, whatever species. At the top, up here, we have to have some sort of organization which owns the key animals. They, where are we? Their key role, of course, is that they have to finance it and they have to set the policy for that set of animals. What are we going to try and improve? How are we going to do it? How are we going to finance it? Of course, they need information, which is obtained by recording, uh, data processing, in those days, of course, data processing was pretty uh, primitive. Um, they need to look after the key animals, those nucleus animals. They need to multiply because genetic selection is always expensive in equipment, in land, in animals, in people. And you need to spread that out over more animals if you're going to be able to run a business. And so you need to multiply. And the multipli multiplication, of course, may be either purebred, as it was in the Border Leicester, or crossbred. And then you have to have a distribution or sales and marketing down to the commercial sector. And of course, it's the commercial sector, which is the largest part of any livestock industry, which is dependent upon what these people up here decide to do. And Lerner and Donald were pretty clear right in 1966 that the pedigree system is inadequate as an organizational structure to implement within breed improvement. It's not, they can't get together to get the scale, to get the finance, and what's more, their policy for what they're going to do with their animals is not motivated by what the people, the commercial sector, wants. They're mainly motivated by what their immediate customers want. And if you think of my Border Leicester structure, 
the immediate customers for those 26 flocks at the top there are the other border Leicester flocks. So what looks nice in the ring? What catches the eye? So Lerner and Donald were quite clear all those years ago that that structure ain't going to work. So what have we got to do? We've either got to teach those people genetics and help them implement policies, or we've got to somehow get them out of the way, encourage other people to take over at the top of a livestock pyramid. And they pointed out even then that to have people playing up at the top there, amusing themselves, buying high-priced rams and selling them to each other, is an inefficiency because they're not doing something useful down at the bottom of the pyramid, which is being paid for by the country, but immediately by the commercial producers who are being shortchanged. They're keeping commercial livestock which are not nearly as improved as they could be. Now they said that in 1966. I've been to a couple of meetings recently where we've had people suggesting, well, oh, maybe they were wrong. We had a nice little presentation from a Norwegian at the Sheep Breeders Roundtable a couple of months ago who showed what wonderful things they were doing in Norway, the pedigree people. We've had Dona Berry giving a couple of presentations, both on the sheep and the beef business in Ireland, showing how oh, we're getting everyone together and, and uh, with a bit of help from the central organisation, uh, things are happening. You could think of pig breeding in Denmark, pig breeding in the Netherlands. These are essentially have grown out of pedigree structures and have become international pig breeding companies. But I suggest to you that those situations are very different from what we have in Britain. In all those countries, we have a strong tradition of cooperation. After all, in Denmark, all the slaughtering, a lot of the feed mills are all cooperative. They're farmer-owned, the same in the Netherlands. Ireland has got a strong cooperative tradition. And in all of those countries, other than Norway, of course, which has defence implications, which is why they put government money into, into the farms. Um, in all of the other countries, farming is an important sector of the economy, and so the government is very inclined to help uh, traditional breeders to uh, adopt modern genetic ideas, modern, I say, 80-year-old ones. So I think that's a very different situation. And my uh, declaration is, it ain't going to work in this country, it hasn't worked so far, and why should we think it's going to work in the future? Okay, so what has happened? Well, this has got to be a fairly quick run through, but you're probably aware that in pigs and poultry, a totally new situation has arrived. It arrived before those books were written, or before Faulkner's book came out, uh, in the poultry industry, it started changing in the 1960s in the pig industry and the pedigree breeders now are, are, are in the entertainment business. It's great fun going to a show and seeing a big fat sow uh, walked around with a stick. But it's got nothing to do with commercial pork production. And we have a corporate body here uh, which has assembled those lines and uh, all of the improvements going on in that top tier and then it's being multiplied, uh, usually not owned by the uh, people who are in charge of the uh, elite stock at the top uh, and then it, it comes down to the people who are actually making money out of producing meat or eggs. Okay, how did it happen? Why did it happen? We can't spend too long on this but particularly as I've stopped in the interval and didn't re put on my timer. I forget about that. Um, poultry, of course, and pigs have a lot of advantages. They're small. You can get a lot of them for not too much money. They turn over quickly. The female reproductive rate is high, so you can multiply up 
you can have crossbred flocks or, or, or herds and so on. But perhaps the, the greatest advantage that the poultry sector had when businessmen came in, bought up some pedigree stock and just left the old pedigree breeders behind, the greatest advantage they had probably was that their customers who were producing eggs or broiler chicks um, or broiler meat kept fairly large units they kept them inside, the feed was all coming in and could be measured, the output going out could easily be measured. It was a control system with a lot of recording done quite simply. Uh, and I, I noted in the bottom box there, the conservative forces were largely absent. I'll talk about conservative forces when we come on to the other species. So there are good reasons why it took off quickly in poultry. When I got interested in, what, 1966 in, in Pigside, um, the advantages were not so obvious. They were larger animals. Uh, there was more capital required to get into uh, commercial pig breeding. But um, they did share some of the same advantages of poultry, particularly that pigs are kept indoors generally, or they certainly were in the 60s, there weren't too many outdoor pigs, um, and inputs and outputs are relatively easily measured and were measured, people were recording. Um, AI there, uh, we'll, we'll pick up that in, in following ones. Um, so there were good reasons why poultry was first and why pigs followed on. And when I was involved in that, it was, it was quite an easy brief really, all of the methods, all of the intellectual property was in the journals. All I had to do was read it and interpret it and teach the people who were, who were working with the pigs. And, and uh, it, it was all there for us. We didn't have to finance all sorts of people in universities to find out new knowledge. It was a very easy run in the 60s and 70s. Okay, let's turn to dairy cattle. Now, uh, there are differences here, of course. They're big. They don't reproduce very much on the female side. They're high value. They need a lot of land, a lot of investment, and so on. Um, but they do have the advantage that dairy farmers, of course, uh, keep them in relatively similar environments. And what's more, the dairy cow comes in twice a day and gets milked. And, and you record its output very easily. And you can easily take a sample and look at quality. And, and so recording um, is quite easy. You don't have to bribe a lot of people to record uh, a dairy herd. But the real key, of course, was artificial insemination came in in the 50s and suddenly a lot of commercial small dairy farms as we had then decided it's a lot easier to buy semen than it is to keep a bull who's a nuisance on the farm. And they very quickly uh, started buying semen from the cooperative uh, semen companies that had been started in our case in this country, it was the Milk Marketing Board largely, a farmer-owned cooperative. And, of course, as soon as uh, a lot of semen from a few bulls uh, went into commercial herds, we then had a nice structure. We had a lot of milking daughters who were recorded. Data could go back again to the people who owned the bulls, and we got into the sort of situation that you all know about, I hope, in the dairy cattle breeding setup we have in this country. There was considerable uh, opposition. There were a lot of pedigree breeders up there who made money and had a lot of fun selling high-priced bulls and cows and heifers in, in, in rings. And to an extent, that still goes on. But it's a sideshow now, and the actual breeding is done by corporate organisations. They may still be... Um, uh, cooperatives, they are in many countries, but in, in the cooperative in this country, of course, uh, eventually uh, was floated a, as, a, as a company. Okay, so the structure we have is quite different from the uh, one in the pig and poultry industries in that the purebred dairy cows sit there. In general, the semen companies haven't owned any females, but there's a huge amount of data goes out into the public domain uh, and the semen companies access this, identify cows which ought to be bull mothers and usually these days contract 
you get a son from one of those cows. And so there's a flow of information from the industry into the semen company and a flow of semen then back into the commercial industry. And that's worked very well uh, in some ways. Uh, notice, as I said before, we haven't uh, managed to make those cows crossbred. There are rather more crossbred dairy herds now in specialist situations, but we are suffering from the fact that uh, our dairy cows are mainly purebred. It's also a lousy business model because the competing AI companies throw all of their data into the public domain and throw their semen into the public domain. So there are no proprietary genetics. So as soon as you've identified a really good bull, your competitor gets the sun from it. So there's an, it's, it's not a very good business model, and the, the, the companies have been cooperatives largely, so they haven't worried too much about it, but they are now, and taking uh, steps to try and get proprietary genetics to compete with each other. Okay. All right, I really want to focus on the beef and sheep sectors. The beef sector, I hope that doesn't look too complicated. Um, the situation I wanted to describe, sorry, is that the, the pedigree beef breeders are still existing pretty much up here, doing what they've always done Okay, there's a certain amount of recording going on and measurement and uh, good e estimated breeding values are affecting prices of uh, bulls sold at auction, but it's a way different from what's happening in the three species we've looked at so far. Now, quite a lot of uh, beef, of course, comes by using beef semen onto some of the dairy cows. Daughters may go into our suckler herds. Uh, crossbred beef comes down here. There is, of course, some of the beef comes straight down, male, male calves from Holsteins. Uh, and then within the overall suckler herd sector in Britain, some of it is first cross, some of it then goes on to second cross. And we do have purebred maybe, or, or synthetic. We have a growing herd in this country of stabilizers, which are synthetic, derived from the USA. So I, I've had to add that to my, my diagram now. That's roughly what the situation is. Um, but the beef cattle breeding still goes on in those pedigree herds, by and large. Why? Well, beef cattle breeding, of course, suffer the same disadvantages as dairy cattle in terms of size and value and low reproductive rate in the female. Um, but they suffer other disadvantages, or the sector suffers disadvantages, in that the production systems for beef are quite variable. Recording and evaluation is not very easy. When you put your beef cows out and you leave them out in the field for a month or two, you don't bring them in twice a day and measure them. Um, it's a real hassle. And so recording continues to be unpopular. In any case, what are you going to measure? You can weigh them with some sophistication. You can ultrasonically measure their eye muscle or something. Um, and then um, AI is not very popular partly because they're running out there on pastures and you'd have to bring them in in order to inseminate them. So there are these disadvantages, but in particular then, this whole business of conservative forces. Now, what are these conservative forces? Well, the herd book societies and the show ring has remained strong, and that's a big social business. I work with the Guernsey breed, and I can assure you, in England, it's much more, it's much easier to get my friends who keep Guernsey cows to get excited about winning the Bath and West show than it is about making a change in the selection index because now we can include fertility into the estimated breeding value. The whole jolly circuit 
is a, is a social business. Uh, I won't talk about SAR licensing, that's gone long ago, luckily. Um, the fact is that beef production is not usually a primary enterprise on the farm in this country. It's, it's normally a secondary enterprise or a tertiary one. Yet the farmer's main focus is not on that. <coughs> We've got a still very strong influence of auction marts. And remember what happens when animals go through an auction mart. They may be weighed. Somebody may come along and put a hand on them to uh, gauge their, their fatness. But essentially, it's looking at them and judging their value on that. And some animals, of course, go through the auction mart once or twice or three times during their lives. So there are multiple owners. So who has an interest in making genetic change? Producer education, not very good. Very few beef farmers or sheep farmers calculate key performance indicators. If you talk to a broiler keeper, he'll know exactly what's affecting his profit and he'll be measuring it every month. It doesn't happen in our beef and sheep industries. And, hands up here, we've done a pretty poor job at teaching farmers in this country who've gone through colleges and universities anything sensible about animal breeding. And I was trying to do it for 15 years. I go and talk to my farmers they don't know anything about a selection index. They don't understand it. And so um, the, the level of, of demand coming from the bottom to tell the people at the top to change their game, it's just not there. Poor market signals is what I said. Um, so how can we encourage more efficient within breed selection going on? Can we really expect the pedigree sector to provide the scale, the finance, and to agree on the policy, what they should be doing there, which would help the people at the bottom of the industry? I don't think we can. Lerner and Donald said we couldn't all those years ago. But we keep trying. A lot of effort's gone in. So what can we do? <sighs> I I was a bit horrified a while ago to find that the talk I'd given 12 years ago in Nashville was available on the internet, and some of you people have looked at it. <laughs> some of these diagrams came from there. Um, it's a suggestion of one sort of structure that we might have in the beef industry. Part of it, perhaps keeping a particular set of cows here, might well be organised, I suggested, by an anonymous beef supply chain group, getting information from the people who have an interest, the finishers and then the abattoir and processors, and the idea that that supply chain group might start specifying what sort of bulls should be bought by the people with cows and therefore getting a pull down and making these people change their tune. At the uh, British Cattle Breeders Club last week or the week before, I was delighted to have ABP, the largest beef processors in this country, uh, talking about the project that they've been doing with SRUC, getting genomic breeding values for carcass traits uh, with, what's the breed? Um, limousines, of course, that's right. But also, um, so that's an illustration of where the abattoir and processor is saying, come on, let's do something. But we also had the, uh, the other group, um, Sorry, what are they, Kirsty? The, the people who are um, growing out cattle here, growing out 50,000 a year and using genus semen. Um, blade, blade farming. Um, they're also looking at uh, 
genotypes there. So we're perhaps starting to get this sort of thing happening. But what I'm saying is we can't rely on change at the top just by teaching the existing pedigree breeders how to use modern methods. It's got to come from another direction. Um, in the United States, where of course the beef industry is very large and relies an awful lot on sorry, um, on the range, cow-calf herds, or not always on the range, requiring vast numbers of natural service bulls, because of course AI is not popular, then I see no reason at all why we can't have a structure very similar to a pig or poultry breeding structure which says, OK, we'll put in a few million, we'll get the ranch, we'll buy the cattle, we'll do the job, and then we will build up a pyramid. Of course, we won't own it. We'll use all the skills we have in making contracts with uh, producers to multiply and so on and get that going. And again, of course, things are starting to happen in that direction. OK, my last section then. I hope I'm not going on too long, Chairman. What about the sheep industry? It's a complex business, of course. Uh, but I just want to concentrate again on the fact that at least a big section of the British industry relies upon a lot of sheep kept on the hills, not as many as there were, and some of these hill sheep are mated to these long wool crossing rams, and those then live and produce on the lowlands. There is another section down here which has been growing. What are the problems in sheep? Well, really, they're not, they're not as great as they are in the beef industry. The animals aren't as big, they're not as uh, expensive. You could keep a lot of them on, on uh, a reasonable sized bit of land. The female reproductive rate is low. I once remember being told when Thornbers, a poultry breeding company, decided they'd get into sheep breeding and they bought uh, Colburn, Oscar Colburn's. I remember uh, John Watson, who used to be on the staff of Abro, who jumped ship and went to work for Thornbers, and his reaction to me was, Morris, these <laughs> rams, you need so many ewes to get a saleable ram. You know, you, you get less than half a ram for sale out of every ewe that you've got. Uh, so reproductive rate is quite important, and I, I suspect that we ought to be looking much more at how on earth can we hike up our uh, numbers of saleable males uh, out of our ram breeding flocks, but uh, that, that's just part of it. Um, but we suffer the same disadvantages as we do in the beef industry. Sheep are out there on pasture, we don't know what they're eating, uh, we don't know much what they're producing, we don't weigh them, when they, we sell them at auction, we, we may get a grading sheep from the abattoir, we, very little information being captured. Um, it, it's not easy, so it's unpopular. AI hasn't become popular in sheep. And again, conservative forces are huge, which means that we are not getting the demand from the commercial sector clearly enunciated and told to those people who are breeding at the top. We've had a lot of encouragement by Meat and Livestock Commission, then Eblex, now it's called AHDB, Beef and Sheep, Signet is the recording organisation. A lot of good work gone into this over the years. There are some useful success stories. I was at the Sheep Breeders Roundtable a couple of months ago. But really, if you look objectively, there's nothing very much happening compared with what it ought to be. Certainly there's been little impact on the hill breeds uh, or on the long wool crossing breeds. Let's look again at that sector that has always interested me. The long wool ram put on 
pale sheep to produce so many animals which perform on the lowlands. There are three million of them still, or there were in the last survey. They produce a quarter of all the slaughter lambs. So they're, they're pretty important animals to our sheep industry. Only two breeds involved, and their only function in life is to inject fertility, hardiness, well, perhaps that comes from the uh, hill ewe, milkiness, and so on, and something in the way of carcass. The border lester has been overtaken by this odd-looking creature, the so-called blue-faced lester. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of flocks. But I can assure you, a lot of those 800 flocks will be tiny. Only half a dozen sometimes. Uh, they only average 18 ewes per flock. You can't do any intelligent quantitative breeding in a flock of 18. And you don't want to collaborate with the others because you're competing with them. Because that's part of the game. I suggested based on no knowledge at all, that there might be a structure like that in the blue-faced Lesters, the way I found in the border Lesters all those years ago. When I talked to Sam Boone of Signet a week ago, he said, no, it's worse than that, Morris, because they've actually more or less split into two now. One of them called themselves blue-faced, and the other called themselves crossing, border crossing Lesters or something. Anyway, we've got that sort of structure. Um, well, a AHDB tries to encourage them to record, but there are only 40 out of those 800 which have been recording. They only record 1,500 lambs a year. How on earth can we encourage greater efficiency? The obvious thing is to try and get more demand coming from the commercial industry. We need more recording so that the commercial flocks are aware of what they're missing. Of course, part of that is getting more standardized carcass information. But we also have got to try and encourage greater scale and economy in the breeding side of things. I think, and it's particularly a subject that I want to throw out to an academic group like this. I think we need to rethink attitudes to ownership of intellectual property. The whole of our sheep recording and beef recording work for the last 40 years has been predicated on the idea of we're all in it together, let's have open source everything, let's put our information out there, let's make sure we've got uh, rams used in a whole lot of different flocks so that we have connectedness. Okay, but that's not the way we've got progress in the industries where we really have made progress in the poultry and the pig business. Those data are not out in the public domain. That intellectual property belongs within the company. There have been uh, worries, of course, among scientists, and we've had them in the EU project that I've been involved in recently, that if we don't have the data out there, scientists like you can't sit and analyze them and move the science forward. But chatting with John this morning, it's pretty obvious that if you have the contacts you can make relationships with those commercial organizations, whether they're poultry or pig or cattle, and with confidentiality agreements, you can get hold of those data and so on. You see, most of our extension work assumes we need a model like the dairy cattle breeding one. I think not enough people in the animal breeding world look over the fence at the other species. They're dairy cattle men, or they're sheep men. Look across and see what's happened elsewhere. And I think my final slide is repeating what Lerner and Donald said all those years ago. 
Our failure is a cost to the nation. In the short term, it's those people trying to make a living out of sheep who are keeping inefficient sheep because no one's done anything about improving the genotypes up in the pedigree flocks. And those people are actually paying for the levy. I actually suggested, and some of you may have noticed in an earlier slide, that continuing to run programs which ask for, uh, which try and teach pedigree breeders what's important, which take their data and analyze it and send it back, I actually suggest that this might be a handicap because it is a disincentive to other forms of structure to go in and say there's a job to be done here. You might think about that. But my final point there, is our current focus appropriate? If you see what's happened in the other species, and of course they have huge advantages, but it doesn't mean to say that we've got to continue with what I think is the disgrace of the lack of applying within herd and flock genetic improvement in beef and sheep in this country. Thank you, Chairman. Australia doesn't, it's quite British in its culture, it doesn't have strong cooperatives, at least to my knowledge, and the Australians have been extremely successful in getting the government to come in and pick up the cost of market failure and effectively fund national breeding programs which have delivered genetic gains for the beef and sheep industry very successfully for a long time. Why can't the, this, in the government in this country do the same thing? Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I mean, my immediate reaction is uh, agricultural exports are pretty important to Australia and they aren't very important to us here. Um, and, and that's the same, of course, as I said, in Denmark, Holland uh, and Ireland. And uh, our government really, we don't even have a Ministry of Agriculture now, remember, <laughs> in this country. It's called, it's called the Department of the Environment. Um, and uh, I, uh, I imagine it is that. Um, things can be done, of course, by charismatic people. Uh, you and I were having a discussion before about a certain New Zealander who decided he would move to Ireland and uh, jazz up and, and, and uh, sweet out the, the breeders and the government and everything else. Uh, and has done wonderful things before his recent retirement. Um, but there aren't too many uh, Brian Wickens around. Uh, but I, I would have thought it was the fact that uh, ag animal production is just not important enough to our government and has been, is important to the Australian one. I mean, I remember about 45 years ago, or was it 55, God, 45 years ago, <laughs> the, the, the Meat and Livestock Commission had newly set up, had a series of scientific study groups, and we went through the various species, and we ended up doing sheep. <coughs> I sort of remember <coughs> the horror of it, with sort of the numbers of breeds that were being, and they're trying to improve about 50 or 60 breeds. I think at that stage, the committee probably made some recommendations and such like, though no one's ever remembered what they were. The right thing should have done just say, sod it and stop playing around and do nothing. If, if, if in fact, let's say, to be, to be slightly provocative, I admit some people in the, in the audience know that spend a lot of time worrying about sheep. If everybody had just ignored that, would we be any worse off? <laughs> <laughs> Pass it along to Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. That's a red rag to a ball, I think. <laughs> I just would like to uh, uh, say that uh, some uh, sectors in the sheep industry have recognised exactly what you've, you've pointed out very eloquently in your talk, Herr Morris, today, and um, have put, got together and uh, grouped what they call phenotype farms. So this is a group of, uh, of farmers that are very interested in doing a lot more uh, detailed recording and getting paid to do so. So they're being paid to deliver uh, phenotypes which are then being used um, uh, for the creation of genomic breeding values for some of the things that are more difficult to record, like carcass traits from the abattoir. At the same time, 
the abattoir are also um, one major abattoir that's, that you mentioned from the, in the beef sector is also now invested in, sh in sheep. So using uh, visual image analysis, ob objective measurements of carcass traits in the abattoir in order to create that demand pull. So farmers will get uh, EBVs for their pedigree, those ones at the top. So you're basically inversing the pyramid upside down. So you're getting the information from the commercial sector that's driving the breeding values for that commercial nucleus in the top. And I see that for our sheep and beef industries as probably being the way that, that, that will go in, in the future. So there are moves, that they're pretty slow, but I think they are happening. Yes, I, I meant to mention that our friend from Waitrose um, did tell me that next year we'll probably have an announcement of the work of Waitrose with um, Innovis uh, in similar sorts of schemes. So things are starting. Uh, it, it, it perhaps combines with what Bill's just said, and I was probably on some of those uh, sheep study groups, I certainly was, uh, if you go back far enough. Um, if we didn't, should we stop it today and encourage these other developments to take place? Should we stop kidding ourselves that we're going to uh, convert people at the top by teaching them things rather than creating a demand, which is what you're saying? Yeah. Perhaps I can change the, the topic back to dairy cattle, Morris, because uh, it's made 20 years, it was 20, 30 years ago, there was a lot of interest in creating uh, elite herds owned by the AI companies where they had complete control of the recording and so on. Uh, what's happened to that and was that a model that was dropped or is it something which is still uh, continuing to be uh, practiced in the dairy breeding? I don't think it has been going on, but it has started. Genus of buying cows, I don't know. I, I'm not privy to what's going on in uh, the others, and I only know genus uh, because I've got obviously one or two friends uh, there, and I have a minority shareholding, so I insist on going to the AGM where there are only three shareholders who appear, uh, and I quiz them and, and, and I read their reports and so on. But th their uh, genus, of course, have recently bought a, uh, an over pickup, uh, a uh, company, a Brazilian one, and they're very interested in selling the whole genome rather than just half of it in the sperm. Uh, now, that of course will depend upon their ability to keep the price of uh, putting an ovum into your cow, a fertilized ovum, rather than a, a sperm. But uh, they're gung-ho on that at the moment, and so they need to have the female side of, of, of that, and, th and they're going in and starting to build up their, their herds. As I said, the, the, the business model I mean, if you, it's published, it's not because I'm privy to it. You go and look on, on the website, look up Genus, and you see their presentations. The, the return on capital from dairy cattle breeding is pretty rotten. Uh, they make, Genus makes three quarters of its profit from pig breeding. And so there's a lot of influence of the thinking of what we developed over those years. Um, the, the, other, the other aspect of this, of course, is that... Um, Part of the business model is that you, you, don't, uh, you don't buy a pig from a, a breeding company now, like PIC. Uh, you pay cost, at, uh, cost price for your, uh, the, the few amount of purebreds that you have to buy in your pyramid, and then you just pay a royalty at the bottom uh, for all the animals you produce. So the whole basis of, of breeding in a, uh, an organization like PIC is royalty-based now, not, not on per dose of sperm or per animal. So quite a different way of looking at it. Um, so things are co uh, coming back. Now, of course, uh, as John reminded me this morning, the, there's quite a crisis going on in, in the uh, cattle breeding companies, the semen companies now, with the arrival of genomics uh, because people are able to uh, go out for a reasonably small sum of money, get a genotype and, and identify some superior animals. Uh, and the, the breeding companies have got to adapt to that. So there'll be quite changes going on in the next decade, obviously. Morris, uh, obviously there are quite a few developments, recent and not so recent. Uh, and the rate of uptake of these developments across the 
species sector, as you've mentioned, has been quite variable. Uh, do you see improving the uptake rate by the, let's call them lagging um, species of uh, technologies uh, of genomics, uh, biomarkers, phenomics, uh, breeding values? Uh, would this be something that would alleviate some of the constraints and the problems that you mentioned? Or are they these structural, structural enough to not even allow this chance to materialize? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is uh, the genomics area going to be a disruptive uh, technology? Um, obviously, those of you who are, have got a lot of time and effort invested in that, some of you believe it will be. Uh, um, one of its main advocates is not with us today. He's down in London. Um, but we all need to think about that question, Georges. Yes. But uh, it... It's going to make it easier, I think, in some situations. Um, but I do believe that anyone who really cares about accelerating progress at the top ought to look much more closely at what the uh, constraints have been to date. Uh, as I try to point out to my genomic friends, it hasn't been the lack of methods of improving which have uh, slowed us up in the past. The methods work perfectly well. They've worked in small animals and plants. They've now worked in a couple of species and so on. Uh, they work all right. It's a question of how we apply them and so what they are. So I'm sure it's going to be... Uh, a combination of uh, some of the new technology, but also, as has become evident, what we said already this morning, uh, new business models. Um, the, uh, the fact that one uh, processor uh, processes a huge amount of beef and sheep and is using, again, different technology there, video imaging and so on. So some of the, the growth and the uh, globalization, if you like, uh, those factors are going to come in. Suddenly, we have groups who are large enough to start taking on this. Uh, whether they realize, uh, whether ABP realizes the uh, potential they've got and the necessity to really control those breeding animals at the top, I don't know. Um, Joe was perhaps implying that create the demand and they'll pull it down and, and people up there will change. I don't know. I, I suspect it's more likely that they've got to make the jump and actually own the animals up there. Uh, but uh, genomics and that new technology uh, and the, uh, the whole business of open pickup and uh, in vitro in vitro fertilization and, and delivering sexed embryos and so on. We had a lovely uh, little video presentation at the Cattle Breeders Club uh, of a, a commercial vet in, in Britain who runs a um, series of labs, and you may be familiar with it, but to, to watch um, them, uh, he, he had videos in his presentation of, of doing open pickup and, and, uh, and then saying, Okay, and then he had a uh, seven-day development of the blastocyst. Uh, and then, okay, uh, we're going to pop this into a cow, but first of all, let's genotype it. And so harvest eight cells from it and, and genotype it before it even goes into the cow. Um, you know, these sorts of things are going to uh, open up new possibilities and can be exploited by organizations with the financial muscle, uh, which we haven't had in the past, I guess. Would you agree that our subsidy system is hampering the increase of efficiency in the sheep and beef sector? And if you agree, then what would you change, essentially? How would you use a subsidy <laughs> to make more use and to increase efficiency of our production systems? I'm sure, yes. The, uh, 
the, the subsidy system which has been given to beef and sheep, of course it's changed over the years, it used to be on per head, didn't it? Um, will uh, and uh, has uh, lessened the hunger of the commercial sector for uh, uh, improvement. Um, how would one use it in the future? Well, I've been uh, daft enough to suggest that AHDB, uh, with its limited budget, might at least go around and talk to the people who are, even in the sheep industry, you know, Innovis, there's, there's Meatlink, the Henry Fell group and so on, and there, there are other people who've been trying to do things. Shouldn't you go along and talk to them about what they think is inhibiting their growth? And the reaction I've had is, oh, they're running businesses, we mustn't help them, we're, we represent the farmers, the levy payers. And my reaction is, uh, <laughs> it's the levy payers who are paying for the inefficiency we've got. I think we need a change in where we spend our money. Now, all right, I've got a, a lot of good friends in AHDB, I've known them ever since Joe Reed and, and uh, David Croston and, and the current ones. But shouldn't we be saying now, that particular method of trying to do it is not being very productive, Should we, shouldn't we try? I've been very disappointed in the, um, in the review. I don't know how many of you have read it, but the review which Peter Amer's group did, it, 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 it's a very inbred sort of uh, report by, by people who think the same way. Uh, this is a report on review of genetic improvement of beef cattle and sheep in the UK with special reference to the potential for genomics. They're thinking inside the box all the time. Um, and that's partly what has motivated me in the last nine months is to <laughs> extend this, these ideas and arguments. Uh, that's about all I can say on that, I think. Okay, I'll move to, to wrap up to thank you, Morris, for a, for a very valuable uh, seminar and, and overview of uh, the animal breeding field as you've seen it over a number of years. Um, <laughs> almost almost um, sorry, a little bit longer than me. I remember H.P. Donald was the first director that I worked at in, in the Animal Breeding Research Organization. We trumpet the success of the, the pig and poultry industry with whom we've got very close links in the dairy industry. Um, and you obviously contributed in your years at PIC to the, the success of the, of, the, of the pig breeding industry. Um, what did you say? Unless the, the, the formula and, and the methods are appropriate, then you know, you're not going to progress. And I think you've done a very good job at highlighting the problems in the, in the beef and the sheep industry. Um, and, and an interesting challenge in as much as you could argue that if grain is a valuable, too valuable a resource to feed to pigs and poultry, then those of us who enjoy a, a steak, um, you know, Beef and, beef and sheep are where you're going to get your meat from, and you know, possibly we ought to make that a much more efficient system than it is at present. So, yeah, a great start to these, uh, this lecture series, um, a, a perspective of many years, and uh, w one from someone who knows full well what's going on at present. So thank you again, Morris, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. <laughs>